the X-ray tube. Produced at Central California School of Continuing Education, this video is narrated by Alex Flood, an instructor for the Limited Permit X-ray Technician Program. The Rotating Anode X-ray Tube. This is the device inside of the um, tube housing that um, is tasked with creating the X-ray beam, the useful X-ray beam that will ultimately create an image by uh, passing through the patient carrying the signal of the body and um, exposing the image receptor. <coughs> These uh, X-ray tubes have been in development since the late 1800s and continue to advance in their technology, although um, <coughs> the major components of the X-ray tube have not changed. The idea behind the X-ray tube is that we're taking advantage of the properties of electromagnetism, specifically that uh, we can harvest the kinetic energy um, of an electron. We can give electrons kinetic energy, which for people that don't know kinetic energy, kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So we're taking advantage of uh, the fact that we can speed electrons up, as well as the fact that um, the law there's a law of nature called the conservation of energy, the law of conservation of energy, which just states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can change forms. And it just so happens that when an electron loses kinetic energy or loses potential energy, it emits a photon, one electron losing potential energy or kinetic energy emits a photon of electromagnetic radiation proportional to the amount of energy lost by that electron. So we can make x-rays from electrons uh, movement. Um, the way this works is you take a glass envelope. These glass envelopes are typically made of Pyrex glass. Uh, Pyrex glass has the nice advantage that it has a high melting point and it's not likely to crack uh, when with uh, temperature changes. Uh, on one side, you have a negatively charged cathode. The cathode has a filament similar to an incandescent light bulb's filament. Um, it has two of them though, uh, different sizes. And those filaments um, create a cloud of electrons which are then um, in crude words, shot across the gap from cathode to this rotating positively charged anode. Now, they don't just spontaneously travel across. We apply a high voltage difference, a high potential difference from one side of the tube to the other side of the tube, and that attracts the electrons because electrons are, of course, negatively charged and they are attracted to a positive charge. So the positively charged anode attracts the electrons and they, they, um, they um, strike the target of the anode at a high rate of speed, a high kinetic energy. The anode rotates, it's not actually necessary that it rotates to create x-rays, but that prolongs the life of the equipment and makes for a more efficient creation of x-rays. Uh, because it rotates, it, it has a rotor. The rotor is powered by electromagnetic induction similar to the motors in an electric car, would ro uh, the way they would rotate the wheels in an electric car. Um, all of this action inside of the glass envelope is done inside of a vacuum. So the inside of the envelope is a vacuum. Uh, that just means that all of the atmosphere has been taken out of the inside of that envelope. The goal is that we take electrons, we put them, we, we take a source of electrons, we give them a high kinetic energy, so we speed them up very fast inside of a vacuum, and then we bring them to a stop very, very quickly. And by doing all of that, we can create x-rays from their kinetic energy. However, um, the, due to the two types of interactions, BREMS and characteristic interactions inside of the x-ray tube, turns out the majority of the interactions are going to basically create heat. The majority of the interactions of the high-speed electrons with the tungsten target end up creating heat. Um, approximately 99% of the energy um, converted from kinetic into electromagnetic at the target 
approximately 99% of that turns into um, heat and visible light. So infrared radiation and visible light in the visible spectrum. We don't see or really um, care about any of that beyond that we just don't want it to come out of the tube. Uh, we, uh, the engineers of the x-ray tubes created a window created a window which is not like a normal window in your house this window is just an area where the glass is a bit thinner and the shielding of the of the tube housing is a bit thinner and that allows the x-rays to come out the direction that we want them to come out but anything any radiation traveling in any other directions are in effect stopped by the tube housing so shown as your shown here as your glass x-ray tube the gray color shows the oil bath around the x-ray tube and the black outline shows the tube housing usually made of lead the goal is to stop the leakage radiation but allow the useful beam to exit the x-ray tube um, because the um, useful beam has to be filtered there's a fitting near the window area for uh, filters and beam collimators. The protective housing is there to uh, limit the amount of um, leakage radiation. Uh, radiation, specifically electromagnetic radiation, travels isotropically and that just means it travels in all directions away from the source. Uh, I like to equate this to like dropping a pebble into a pond and watching the ripples move away from where you dropped the pebble in. Uh, it works very similar, I, you know, the point where the electron strike is like the point where the pebble hits the pond and the radiation, the electromagnetic energy, even though it travels at light speed, it travels in wave form away from the source. Our goal, the goal of the uh, protective housing is to limit leakage radiation to less than 100 millirad per hour at one meter from the source. So measured one meter from the source, leakage should be less than 100 millirads per hour. This is an FDA regulation, a Food and Drug Administration reg a regulation. And uh, lastly, we want the useful beam to be emitted through the window. Um, the electrical part of this, uh, the protective housing is not just there to limit radiation, it's also to keep us from being electrocuted by any of the electrical components, and we're dealing with large amounts of electricity here. We're dealing with anywhere from approximately 50 to 120,000 volts, kilovolts. Um, to put that into perspective, um, your regular wall sockets that you plug into to charge your computers, plug your TVs in, your toaster, all that stuff, those run at 110 volts. Even your um, dryer, if you have an electric dryer or if you do use any um, bit larger equipment in your garage, for example, those larger plugs are only 220 volts. We're dealing with anywhere from 50 to 120,000 volts when we create x-ray. So it's a high voltage um, piece of equipment. So for that reason, there are, are high voltage cable receptacles that plug into the protective housing and basically eliminate the possibility for you to be electrocuted unless you know you do something that's grossly out of normal um, heat it, heat dissipation depends on tube design but for the most part there's an oil bath that surrounds that glass x-ray tube and uh, heat moves away from the x-ray tube, heats up the oil, the oil heats up the tube housing, the tube housing heats up the air in the room a little bit, and heat is dissipated in that way. The x-ray tubes cathode and filament. This is the source of electrons, and as I stated earlier, there's a few things that are required to create x-rays. One of them is a source of electrons, a source of free electrons. Now we know that normally electrons are in orbit around an atom, at least a stable atom has electrons in orbit around it. Um, those number of electrons usually equal the number of protons in that atom to make the atom neutrally, uh, n uh, neutrally balanced, not no charge, positive or negative. 
What we've done here, what we do here is similar to an incandescent light bulb, where in an incandescent light bulb you run electricity through the filament, and the electrons from that filament uh, emit light, uh, emit visible light as they kind of jump off of and jump back onto the filament. Well, a very similar thing's happening. We're doing something called creating a space charge, essentially a cloud of electrons around the filament. Um, shown here is the cathode um, cup, the focusing cup of a dual focus x-ray tube. Most x-ray tubes are dual focus in that they use two filaments, one at a time, but two filaments, uh, one about half the size of the other, and this allows us to make a stream of electrons that is either wide or narrow, depending on our electrical requirements and the, uh, the geometrical properties we're trying to achieve. The cathode, remind you, is negatively charged. Um, the cathode is where the electrons come from, and by being negatively charged, it sort of repels the electrons, which are also negatively charged, away from the cathode. It's made of a uh, filament, uh, two filaments, as I stated, that are approximately 0.2 millimeters in diameter of coiled tungsten wire. Um, thermionic emission, which I also called space charge, occurs if the filament is heated above 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, tungsten's melting point, by the way, is higher than that, 3370 degrees Fahrenheit, so we're at no risk of melting the cathode filaments, but uh, we can heat them up high enough to where we can cause the electrons to, to um, I like the word boil off, to boil off away from the, um, the cathode filament. Now, they don't all boil off. As some boil off, others are cooling down and others are boiling off, and it's sort of a, a cyclical process like that, but we create a, char a cloud, a, a space charge of electrons around that coiled tungsten wire. Uh, the coiled tungsten wire has a low tendency to vaporize because its melting point is higher than the thermionic emission temperature. Um, in some cases, they are mixed with 1 to 2% thorium, which increases thermionic emission e efficiency. The focusing cup is the negatively charged part. The focusing cup has a negative charged shroud that focuses the electrons into a small target area. Uh, think of it like your uh, car's headlights, how they, how they um, cone down your headlights beam so it points just straight forward. It's a similar idea, but uh, we're working with, uh, with electric charges here. Thermionic emission. Um, the filament circuit, uh, or filament current, um, controls how much the uh, how much thermionic emission is occurring. So there's a separate circuit uh, called a low voltage circuit that runs through the filament, and um, uh, by selecting, for example, a one milliampere or the other, you select one filament or the other, and you select amount an amount of current that flows through that filament. The higher the uh, milliampere selection, the more thermionic emission occurs, um, and uh, that the uh, circuitry will move you from a small, the small filament to the large filament to protect the equipment. The space charge is the cloud of electrons. Uh, we can call it, uh, you can call it space charge or thermionic emission. Either one is, is, is appropriate, uh, but it's a cloud of electrons that surrounds the filament. Um, the electron cloud, uh, once, it's once it's created, inhibits further thermionic emission, essentially keeping it kind of static. They call it, in fact, electrostatic repulsion. High filament current with low KVP may cause space charge limitations. So you'll see your equipment, um, for example, changing you from small, uh, from small filament to large filament, oh, it's listed as focal spot, so from small to large filament, when you use um, different KV levels, and it's doing that really to protect itself. The equipment's, uh, the, the uh, engineers set it up so that the circuitry is designed to protect itself. So this is a view of the focusing cup um, with its negative charge. The focusing cup, by the way, is usually made of nickel. Uh, with its strong negative charge, 
and what that does is, as I stated, sort of pushes in, sort of pushes in on the electron stream. The electrons are repelled from each other. They're ne all negatively charged, so they're repelled from each other. And the negative charge of the cathode has to exceed the repulsion of the individual electrons from one to the other so that we can create an electron beam that is focused at a spot on the anode, on the anode's target. We call that spot, funny enough, the focal spot. Um, the stream of electrons only go only travels from cathode to anode um, when the high voltage circuit is activated. So as I stated, the low voltage circuit is there to build the space charge around the cathode, but the high voltage circuit is, is then applied across the gap from cathode to anode to basically shoot the electrons across to attract the electrons across to the anode at approximately 60% the speed of light. The x-ray tube's anode. The x-ray tube's anode is made of tungsten which has the property that uh, of having a high enough atomic number to efficiently create x-rays. Usually that tungsten is alloyed with another metal, in this case rhenium. Um, all of the target interactions occur in the outer layers of the, of the target. So the lower layers can be made of cheaper, um, softer metals like molybdenum and backed with graphite. The line focus principle. When the electron beam travels from cathode to anode, um, it's focused it's focused into a point, but it's not, it's not an actual uh, point. Uh, it has an area. In this case, the area is being shown as approximately one by four millimeters. Um, due to the angle of the um, anode's uh, bevel, uh, in this case, the anode's bevel is 15 degrees. Uh, due to the anode's bevel, it changes what is the, um, the size of the actual area, the electron strike, compared to the area of parent from the point of view of the receptor. Uh, the apparent size of the focal spot will change dependent on if um, we're, we were to view, if from the receptor point of view, if we were to be further towards the cathode side of the table or further, further towards the anode side of the table. But in any case, the line focus principle says that the effective or apparent focal spot will always project smaller than the actual focal spot at an angle um, perpendicular to the anode. The anode heel effect. The anode heel effect states that due to the extra uh, material that the x-ray beam has to travel through towards the positive side of the table, the beam on the positive side of the table will always be weaker than the beam towards the cathode side of the table. Now we measure uh, all of these intensities as being relative to the central axis or the central ray, the middle part of the x-ray beam. The cathode side of the table can be a, a, as strong as 110% of the, of the central beam, 108% of the central beam, and the positive side uh, where the anode heel effect takes place can be as weak as 75% of the intensity of the, of the uh, central axis beam. Uh, so the intensity is lower at the anode side of the field and higher at the, at the cathode side of the field. And again, this is due to the attenuation in tungsten uh, because of the exit path of the x-ray beam being longer at the anode side and shorter at the cathode side. 